Great. Thank you so much, Kristen. I trust that I'm off mute and you can see my slides. Yep. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much for the introduction and for, for having me here today. Um, thanks everybody for being here. That was really exciting to see so many people from so many different places represented in the chat. That's great. Um, I am very excited to talk about this work about engaging youth voices to improve prevention and hopefully to provide you with some tips and tools. So one of my kids is a first grader and he has informed me that every author or speaker should have a main purpose in what they're sharing. So he has taught me that the main purposes of writing are number one, to persuade somebody of something, number two, to inform people, and number three, to entertain. Um, or PI. So in the spirit of PI, um, my main purpose today will be mostly to inform um, about some different models of youth engagement that your organization might consider um, in order to amplify the voices of youth in your prevention work. I'll do a little bit of persuasion about why I think a youth engagement approach is a really flexible um, and um, uh, can be a really beneficial approach to take in your prevention work. And I'm not promising to entertain you, but I will try to be as engaging as possible as we go through this material today. So I think you've seen the learning objectives, but again, presenting some models of youth engagement and really thinking through some of the key questions that you can ask yourself as an organization as you prepare to start engaging with youth um, or to deepen your youth engagement efforts in order to improve your substance misuse prevention work. We'll start with a big shout out. Um, this work was um, grew out of funding from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. I'm part of a team that's been doing the evaluation for the substance, the prevention portion of the substance abuse block grant funds for North Carolina. So we really thank the, our partners, the state, for investing in this work as part of our statewide evaluation work. I also thank NIDA for some funding that's allowing me to build on and continue this work. And I'll talk about that project as well. Um, huge shout out to our team. Of course, science happens in teams and I work with some really wonderful people. So the kind of formative work that a lot of this um, information today grew out of was a study that we did in North Carolina where we interviewed 21 members of the prevention provider workforce across North Carolina. And we really wanted to know what do people understand about youth engagement? What does that mean to prevention providers? How are they using youth engagement and partnering with youth in their work? Um, what barriers are they facing and what do they need? Those were kind of the questions just to really get a lay of the land here in North Carolina. Now, the rest of this material will be more broadly applicable, but this work really did grow out of North Carolina eventually. So what we found was overall, the interviewees really shared that working alongside young people is very intuitive. So people in the prevention provider workforce say, yes, this is great, we wanna do this, we wanna work with youth, and also we recognize that it really increases the impact of our prevention work. So for example, one of our um, participants shared this quote, um, I very much think that the most effective projects we've ever done definitely have been those with community involvement, service learning, youth-led initiatives, but they're hard to do. And if that doesn't just encapsulate it perfectly, I mean, that was just um, really shows that the, the belief in the value of engaging with young people in your prevention work, but also recognition that it can be really challenging. So specifically, the interviewees identified three main needs that, that they really need to better implement youth engagement. The first is training for organizational staff. Um, the second is training to provide to, for youth partners. And the third is really um, opportunities to share knowledge with colleagues who might be doing the same work in parallel, um, but without a lot of opportunity to kind of share together what you're learning and what the barriers are. So at least in part to, to address that first need for organizational training, um, we, we've been supported by the North Carolina um, Substance Abuse Block Grant to continue this work to really develop um, a, um, an information guide series about youth engagement. So I'm really excited today to say that we've finished it and we're officially ready to share this work. This is free and will be publicly available. Um, Kristen, if you want to go ahead and share the link in the chat, now would be a great time to share the link to this information guide. I believe we'll also follow up with people on this webinar to share it by, um, by email as well. So thank you so much to all the community members who've shared expertise. Particular shout out to Ms. Jessica Dickin and Dr. Angela Maxwell, who've really invested as partners in hearing what um, the, the prevention provider workforce needs in terms of youth engagement, and then investing in continuing to kind of provide for some of those needs. Also, thanks so much to our team at Wake Forest um, and to some colleagues who provided graphic design as well as critical feedback on the guide. So before jumping too far into the content here, I got to do some definitional stuff. And the first really important piece is probably who are youth, right? If I keep saying youth engagement, who do I mean by youth? 
Um, well, I actually gave a whole webinar through the PTTC about three years ago on this topic um, that really delves into who do we mean by youth? Um, this is a complicated question. I'm a developmental psychologist. We always kind of hate answering this question, um, but it really, it really matters. So as your organization thinks about engaging with youth, you do need to think really carefully about who are the youth, right? At what age and what developmental stage? So I do, I do want to refer you to the previous webinar for a really, um, we, we delved in deep to the topic of different um, ages and stages. But today, when I talk about youth, I'm really broadly talking about um, young people between the ages of 11 and 25. And of course, the particular youth you're working with, that, that will matter a lot how you define what youth is for your own work. Okay, so another really critical definition. What do I mean by youth engagement? So when I talk about youth engagement, I'll, then I'll use the acronym YE, I am talking about an approach to prevention where prevention organizations are effectively engaging youth as leaders or partners in planning, tailoring, implementing, and or evaluating their prevention programming. So I'm really talking quite broadly about youth engagement as an approach that really is about partnering with young people, really amplifying the voices of young people in your work. I am not talking about delivering specific curricula or programming to youth. So I think sometimes the term youth engagement um, gets used to mean like how, how far did you reach? How many youth showed up to an event? Um, and that's not how I'm using the term. I'm using the term really to talk about engaging young people as partners and leaders in your work. So I wanted to do a quick poll in the chat. Um, are you from an organization that engages youth by that definition, by partnering with them in planning, tailoring, implementing, and or evaluating your prevention programming? Um, if you would, in the chat, put your location, your organization name, and very, very briefly how you partner with youth, like what, what youth partner in what exactly. Um, that would be really helpful. I can't see, I can see the chat popping up. So let me see if I can read a couple. I see a couple of yeses. We're seeing see yeah, any... lots of yeses. Mm -hmm. um, but you'd like to know specifically how they partner with youths. Uh, Janine says it's their goal and they're trying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you might just read a couple, Kristen. I, I, I won't. Savannah, oh sure. Savannah um, is the youth empowerment specialist, so she works daily with youth in the schools. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. Lori's been doing building Dover Youth to Youth in some of their counties. Uh huh. Um, the Raleigh, the North Carolina Post Center, they do have a youth empowerment group. Mm -hmm. Cincinnati, they're doing um, youth mental health education. And mm -hmm. uh, Amy with Waypoint Runaways, a uh, homeless youth program, and they do work in youth centers. So it's, it's a lot of variety. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, Kristen. So if you would keep putting them in the chat, even if I'm not going to talk about them now, I think it might help um, people to know who's in the room and to connect with others who might be doing something similar. Um, also, I will really closely read the chat later because I'm very curious what different organizations are doing in this space. So please keep going in the chat if you would. Um, so when I'm talking about a youth engagement approach, I'm talking about something that can work with many different existing prevention approaches and strategies. And that's really central to how I talk about this. So this, these are the, the six CSAP prevention strategies. And I just want to make the point that if you're doing these strategies, you could potentially really incorporate youth engagement into any of them. And as an example, um, an organization might be doing an information dissemination campaign where you're um, designing or implementing a communication campaign. That might be something where the uh, messaging has already been developed, um, but you might think, well, could we could we use youth input and perspective on what the message, how to tailor the messages if that's allowable within your communication campaign, or um, how to deliver the messages, what modalities to use, when and where to best reach youth. So that's an example of how you could effectively engage or partner with young people in an already pre-existing strategy or approach that you're using. So I, I do. I, I heard someone in the chat shouted out Dover Youth to Youth. I did. I did want to shout out that there are a lot of existing youth empowerment models and programs in prevention. So Dover Youth to Youth is one that I think is excellent. They have a whole kind of off the shelf model that you can purchase. You can purchase a binder and all their materials, and you can try to implement their youth empowerment model um, within your prevention. I think it's great. Um, they also, if you go to their website, um, they give a lot of. They partner with people and have their young people do presentations as well as trainings like adult ally trainings or um, trainings to youth. So they do kind of a wide range of work that's really great. Um, there's a different model in out of Colorado called Youth Uprise that does a really fantastic um, partnering with youth 
taking on tobacco as a justice issue. And they have a really cool model. If you Google them and look at their website, they also provide some very short videos on um, short training videos on uh, topics that are really relevant to youth engagement. And there are lots of others. So I want to make the point here that these exist. There are programs off the shelf or other models that you can use. Um, but it's what I'm doing today is talking a little bit about something different. That is a youth engagement approach um, where your organization, I'm inviting you to consider a couple of questions. One, how could our prevention work um, really benefit from the perspectives of youth? And where in our existing workflow, so where within what we're already doing, might we include or amplify the voices of youth? So here I'm recognizing now, especially from a lot of the people in the chat, that you're already partnering with youth in some ways, or at least working with youth. Um, so thinking about like within what we're already doing, can we amplify the voices of youth um, into our own work? So here's where I'll do a little bit of persuasion. It sounds like a lot of people attending don't need persuading, but I did want to just talk through what I see as some of the major benefits of youth engagement for your organizations. And I did, again, in, in the last webinar a few years ago, talk really about the benefits of youth engagement for the youth. Um, so, so here I want to think about um, specifically how could youth engagement benefit your organization? Well, ideally, it increases the relevance of your prevention program or policy or practice, whatever your organization is focusing on. Um, ideally, it can increase the reach or uptake or quality of your prevention that is aimed towards young people. It can really provide ongoing insight um, or assessment or improvement as youth culture changes. So I think we can all agree that youth is not one thing. Um, youth culture is changing. So um, programs that were designed 20 years ago to engage or empower youth might need updating. So there might be a place where um, amplifying the voices of youth or partnering with youth to get input on you know, present day youth culture can be really valuable. One obvious one is with technology, right? We know how quickly technology is changing, of course, and um, young people are the best experts on how best to leverage technology, reach young people um, with your prevention work that you're doing. So, so in, in increasing the amount of youth voice you have can really help with um, keeping your finger on the pulse of youth culture. Um, it can also provide opportunities to the youth themselves for skills, for support, for connection, for a chance to make a contribution to their community. So I think even though we're focused today on um, how organizations can really effectively use youth engagement, it's important to keep in mind that in its best form, youth engagement should also be an offering or an opportunity for young people themselves, it should be an empowering practice for young people. And of course, you can build youth capacity. Um, so the prevention, you know, working towards building up the prevention workforce pipeline by building those relationships with youth and building up their skills and capacity to maybe go on in their own education and end up in the field of prevention. Okay, so <clears throat> with those benefits in mind, if you're an organization thinking about considering choosing a youth engagement model, from my perspective, these are the three things to do to start. So think really carefully about your organizational capacity, consider your youth capacity, and the third is consider the goal of engaging with youth. And I'm gonna go into detail about each of these because I think this is really critical. Um, I am coming at this mostly from an organization who might be considering starting up a youth engagement model, but this is also really relevant if you're already doing some form of youth engagement to think about um, these three considerations. Okay, so the first one is considering your organizational capacity. And here, I think it's really critical to think in kind of four different areas. What are our resources? What's our infrastructure? What are our knowledge and skills? And what is our organizational culture around youth engagement? So by resources, you might think about things like, do we have an inviting space that's youth friendly? Um, or if not, do we have technology that might work to engage youth? This is especially important if you're looking to engage rural youth or youth who have transportation barriers, which is a lot of young people. Um, do, you know, do you, do you have any transportation you can offer to get youth to you or any potential partnerships you could leverage to, to reduce the transportation barriers that so many young people face? Um, another major resource is funding. So an organization, um, and I'm sure people can empathize if you have engaged or partnered with youth, it takes a lot of um, resources, including funding, to be able to do that in a deep and meaningful way. So I would really carefully consider your resources that you have and what you need. 
um, and consider your infrastructure. So infrastructure could be something like, do you have a full-time staff person who's really passionate about partnering with young people? Um, if not, could you know, do you have some percent effort of a staff person who's willing to get some training to work toward that? Um, does your organization have a vision around youth engagement? Do you have some ideas of what that will look like short term and long term? And do you have processes already in place? So some organizations already partner really effectively with communities and maybe partnering with youth communities might be an extension of some really robust process you already have in place to do that. Another area of organizational capacity is knowledge and skills. So here I would consider things like what is your own organizational experience? Um, you may have um, pretty extensive training. Um, Speaking of Dover Youth to Youth, they've offered a lot of training. You might have gone through one of those, and so you have you know, some adult allyship training. You might have content knowledge in community engagement or in youth development that might serve you really well. So I would assess what knowledge and skills your organization currently has. And a final piece of organizational capacity is culture. So this is a little less tangible, but I would think about things like in general, as an organization, um, do your adult staff members have a re deep respect for young people? Um, have you thought about adultism and potential biases you might have um, that will crop up when partnering with young people? Um, do you have a history of work with, with youth partners or with organizations that serve youth partners? Um, I think a, a, an organizational commitment to learning and growing can be a real important piece of culture that can really open up feedback loops when working with young people to actually incorporate their feedback in a meaningful way. Um, as well as a commitment to power sharing. And this is one that'll come up over and over again with partnering with youth is does your organization have some commitment to sharing power with young people um, and maybe even have a process in place for doing that. So I know this, this is um, talking kind of fast and um, sharing a lot of information, but just as a reminder, we will share slides and the recording and the youth engagement guide for more detail on all of this. Okay, so that's the first consideration, thinking really and really closely about your organizational capacity. Um, a second consideration then is really looking at your youth capacity. And in this context, I'm talking about a couple different things. One is your existing relationships or experience with working with young people. So do you have that capacity already for, for youth partnerships? Um, and the second piece is with, do you have relationship with youth themselves that already have, um, some knowledge and some skills. So maybe you have worked with uh, an after school club that has young people who has gotten some training in substance misuse prevention. So you may not have worked with those directly with young people before, but you may work with an organization where the young people are already on their way to, to gaining some of their own kind of important skills that they might need to partner with you. Okay, and the third thing, major consideration as you start thinking about how to build or deepen your own youth engagement is consider, consider very, very carefully the goal of engaging with youth. So I think one thing to think about is, do we really need to partner with youth and get youth perspective in kind of a one-time um, situation where we're working on some initiative right now that's going to be um, targeting a high school and we really need youth input on that? Or is your organization looking to build kind of a, a longer term sustained effort um, to partner with young people? And after thinking through that, I would encourage you to get very, very specific about your goal. Um, at this time, why does my organization really need to engage the voices of young people to make our work better? And I'll say I, I work with organizations helping them develop youth engagement models, and I hear this a lot. We need to hear youth voice, like we need to get the youth perspective. And this is often really um, excited. Um, and my response is like, yes, it's cool. Um, but what do you need input on specifically? And then, and this is really important, what will you do with the input once you get it? And this was where like the devil's really in the details with like, even if everybody shares a commitment to in theory, the idea that youth voice is really important, getting really specific about why it's important to our organization and our work at this moment is really critical to then help define what your youth engagement could look like. And also equally important, what can your organization really do with the feedback you receive? And that's really critical when working with anybody, um, but it's especially critical of young people when asking young people to take their time um, and expertise to share with your organization. They really need to know like what it's going towards, like can what they say shift or change your organizational priorities or could they help influence what um, prevention education 
program you actually choose or not. And it's okay if there are some limits to, to what you can do and change with young people's input. But it's really important to get clear up front about what you can and, and can't do and what you want to do with the input you get from youth. Okay, so those are kind of the three major considerations I would recommend starting with at your organizations. And then this is kind of my view of different, uh, different models of youth engagement. I see that there are kind of four different buckets of youth um, engagement models. The first are youth consultant models, and then we have youth board models, and then we have youth partner models, and finally, I would say youth led models. And I'm gonna talk specifically and kind of define each of these models. But first, I want to share a tool that we've come up with that we really hope can help organizations use those, those three considerations that I just talked through and come to a decision about what model might work really well for an organization at a given point in time. And this decision tree tool, this is a, a screenshot of it, but I'll take you through um, kind of how I would think through which model might suit your organization. So the first, back to that first consideration I talked about is thinking about what's your current organizational capacity for youth engagement. And I would try to think, okay, are we kind of in the none or low? Like we just don't have that much capacity right now. That might mean we don't have current funding. We don't really have a great space. Um, we don't currently have a lot of staff devoted to that. Um, or are you at like a sum or high capacity? That means maybe you got a new grant that includes a little bit of funding for the next three years to, um, to incorporate some, some youth voice or um, maybe of high capacity, maybe you've been working with a youth board or um, a youth coalition for years um, and you're ready to go to the next level with your own youth engagement. Um, if you're kind of in the, like currently we don't have a ton of capacity for this and I would think, okay, well, do we really wanna build this kind of one-time effort or a, more of a sustained effort? If you're looking to build a one-time effort, I think a nice model to start with might be a youth consultant model. And again, I will go through what that looks like. Um, if you're wanting to build more of a sustained approach, then I would say, can you ask yourself, like, have you, have you done youth engaged efforts before? Have you partnered with youth before? If not, you might consider building, and I would say slowly building toward um, a youth board that might advise your organization. If you've used youth engaged efforts before, you might think about different youth partner models. Um, and there are lots of different youth partner models that I'll talk through um, what some of those might look like. Um, if you're on this over on this right side of the graphic with some sum or high current organizational capacity, then I would really assess your youth capacity and think about um, if you're in the none or low range, maybe think about those youth partner models. And if you're really at high capacity, both in terms of your own organization and youth that you already have relationship with or um, have high potential to partner with right now, then you might go with um, youth led models. In my view, kind of one way to organize or think about the, the different levels of youth engagement is by thinking about a ladder graphic. Um, so if your organization is brand new to youth engagement um, and and or have kind of lower level needs or lower capacity, you might think about starting kind of lower on this ladder with a youth consultant model at this time. That might be perfect for you. Working up the ladder kind of increases the level of, of youth engagement and the level of youth involvement um, that you're looking at with the different models and will require more capacity of your organization, um, probably more staff time and just more support for the youth and for your staff and your organization in order to do it really well. Again, I'll be talking through each of these models and what they entail, but I wanted to make one really important point here while we're on the ladder graphic. So I do not think your goal should be necessarily to start high or to even to climb the ladder. So I think sometimes a ladder graphic implies that moving up is what you're supposed to do. Um, but I don't think everybody's goal needs to be youth led models. Um, I think the the way to think about it is what is what is the right size model of engaging youth for our organization at this point in time, given our needs and capacity. And I often think starting low and taking a slow approach, if you're wanting to build that out, um, is, is a really good approach. Okay. So given that, that kind of the, my schema of the four, four different models of youth engagement, um, let's talk specifically about what they might look like. So youth consultant models, I think about um, organizations potentially recruiting young people to provide input on a really specific issue or initiative. Um, youth might consult on a project on an as needed basis um, or, can, or can be involved in a more kind of structured way. 
I think this model is especially useful for organizations just starting out with youth engagement because it really does require kind of a lower level of organizational capacity. Um, Still, I think it's really important for organizations to think about, first of all, how to compensate youth for their expertise. And one thing to be very wary about, especially with a youth consultant model, is not tokenizing young people by choosing one or two and having them speak for all youth. I think probably a lot of people on this call um, maybe can empathize with, with having done that before or having seen that before, where you invite the input of one or two people and you're like, great, we got youth voice, um, but really it's not fair um, to ask a couple young people to speak for all youth and youth are very diverse um, with regards to a lot of different um, things. So I think that's something to be especially wary of with youth consultant models. Um, I think small groups of youth can serve as consultants or, or one or two and, and youth consultants could change as organizations change or as the needs projects initiatives of organizations change. Um, here's just an example. We've come up with several examples that are especially tailored to the North Carolina um, kind of prevention um, landscape, but this should be um, relatable outside as well. So an example would be after completing uh, some best practice planning steps, a prevention organization has decided to implement a communication campaign around misperceptions of the prevalence of vaping. So their target audience for that is high school students. Um, but they're not sure how to best reach high school students or where to dis display messages. So they might work with two youth consultants for the duration of planning and implementing and evaluating the campaign in order to improve the effectiveness and the reach of their campaign. So in this instance, youth might be hired as consultants to provide suggestions on things like where to display messages. All right, so now moving up the ladder a little to what I would consider kind of a next, a little bit higher level of youth and in, youth involvement would be youth board models. <clears throat> All right, so youth advisory board models. So this is where um, a body of young people would provide ongoing input and insight on into an organization's policies and procedures and activities. A key here is really that this is usually more ongoing um, so really thinking about a youth board as a little bit of a longer term commitment. Um, the youth advisory board could provide input on a whole range of things from selecting, implementing, evaluating your prevention programs and strategies. Um, I think with youth board models, I think it's especially useful for organizations who want to build something sustainable. So who want to kind of work towards an infrastructure for gathering youth input on a more ongoing basis and who probably have some existing capacity already and some youth relationships in place. Typically with youth advisory board models, the, the young people receive a little bit of higher levels of training. So for example, they might receive training in prevention and in the work of your organization, but they might also really receive training in how your organization operates in terms of like how to run effective meetings, um, how your organization makes decisions. So they really have a good under, understanding of how to advise your particular organization. Youth advisory boards have become pretty popular. I would say what I've seen in the last few years is that a lot of people have, have developed or have tried to develop youth advisory boards. Um, I, I think something that I hear is that um, these can be really hard. Um, so I think one thing to be wary of, again, is tokenizing. So just having a youth advisory board doesn't necessarily guarantee that your organization feels really prepared to use the input or advice that the advisory board provides. Um, and it can feel really tokenizing for young people, especially if they're committing to a regular or ongoing process, I would be really wary of making sure you're real clear on how you can use the input of youth and making sure that's also um, very clear to the young people themselves. And again, it's totally appropriate for youth input to be one of many inputs to your organizational decision making. Um, but when, when um, when creating a youth advisory board, I think that's a problem I've seen a lot of organizations have is um, really not really knowing, not really having the process in place for what to do with the, the input of the advisory board. And that can end up with young people feeling tokenized and organizations feeling quite frustrated. So as an example, um, thinking about a prevention organization, hearing from community partners that prescription medication misuse has increased among high school students locally. Um, maybe this organization is considering a lot of different strategies and decide to convene a youth advisory board that includes young people from different local high schools to meet six times per year for a couple years to advise the organization on what the needs are and what strategies might be really effective. 
So in this example, some of the keys are um, getting young people from a lot of different high schools, since that's kind of what they're really targeting is high schools in general. So getting kind of diverse perspectives, as well as having a structured approach of meeting six times per year for a couple of years, kind of defining the term and defining the commitment up front. All right, moving up the ladder slightly to youth partner models. So I think of youth partner models as a very general model that can look a lot of different ways. Um, so I have included, you know, you, your organization could partner with youth as researchers, um, youth could be partners as evaluators, um, you could have youth partners who are organizers or advocates, you might have youth partners who are actually hired as interns or staff, um, you might have youth partners that implement programs. So think of this one as involving a high level of youth involvement in partnership, um, but being really flexible in how exactly you partner with youth. So I think of this as um, organizations partner with young people to select, implement, or evaluate their prevention programs or strategies. Um, this is, really involves a higher level of youth involvement, and really the key is the youth-adult partnership. So this really takes it to a different level where it's, it's less adult-led, but at this point you're really thinking about co-leading something um, with young people compared to the models we just talked about, more consultant or youth advisory board, where that's really more considering youth input. Once you get to a youth partner model here, you're really sharing power here. You're really inviting young people to partner with you to design and implement or, or um, whatever the, the piece of the work may be. So I think the nature of the role of the youth partner depends a lot on the needs of your organization, um, as well as the skills and goals of the youth partner. So from that perspective that you're really partnering here, I think a good approach might be for an organization to say, okay, we really need some, you know, youth expertise or input on our evaluation. Um, then looking for that right youth partner up front and letting the youth um, co-design what that might look like. So you might start with a general idea of what you want, but then here you're, you're finding the partner early and getting them involved in designing what your evaluation might look like. So here you might really need a young person who has some um, evaluation training or expertise to help you kind of co-design that effort. Um, an example here uh, is would be partnering with youth as researchers. So a prevention organization might be working with a high school experiencing high rates of binge drinking. Um, perhaps they want to understand the culture around drinking from students at the school, so they partner with a group of students from a school to collect data about per perceptions of um, drinking and understanding of local school board policies, and together they might implement like a series of interviews or surveys, some way of collecting data that they then present back to school board to review and improve existing policies. And here I'll just mention, um, because I'm in the field of research that there's a whole model of partnering with youth on research called YPAR or Youth Participatory Action Research. Um, if you Google it, um, or I have also shared resources um, later, um, you'll find quite a bit about effectively partnering with young people to design a research project. So the key here is really a higher level of partnership, which takes a lot of effort and skill on the part of an organization, as well as on the part of a, a group of young people to kind of co-design and, and, and partner um, and share power in your prevention work. All right, so moving on to kind of the top of the ladder here, what I call youth-led models. This really, really involves a very high level of youth engagement. So this might be for the people on the call who have been working alongside youth for a long time for um, maybe you have a um, uh, projects in place, maybe you have a youth coalition that's very active or you already have had a youth advisory board for many years. Maybe there are a couple people who have, a couple young people who have really stood out and you're ready to kind of, they're ready to lead an initiative under kind of the guidance of your organization. Here, um, trained and experienced youth lead projects with the support of your prevention organization. Often to be really, you know, uh, prepared to do a youth-led model, these are older young people. Um, I've heard models of college students who are kind of majoring in the health sciences and have been working with uh, prevention organizations for many years and have been in relationship with them, taking on a project where they're actually um, Design, designing or tailoring a kind of prevention approach, but they're really leading it. Um, this is especially useful if you have long-standing partnerships with youth already in place. Um, and this could also be if you don't have a 
you as an organization, if you haven't been working with youth specifically, but um, but you've been in partnership with an organization where youth are very active in prevention work, that might you know give you something that you can leverage in terms of finding a youth partner. All right, just as an example here, um, a youth coalition that has had an advisory board for many years, um, youth with the support of their adult allies have decided to create a podcast and newsletter series in topics relevant to local youth, including substance use in the community. Um, with a lot of support um, to acquire equipment, resources, and training, the youth develop a podcast series. This is actually based on a real example that I've read about. Okay, so I hope at this point you're persuaded a little bit that youth engagement can be a flexible approach um, and that has a lot of different models that your organization can potentially use to amplify the voices of young people that really works within what your organization may already be doing. Um, I want to emphasize again here that this does not need to be um, starting really high or even working your way up to doing 100% youth led efforts. Um, and the reason I keep emphasizing that you don't need to start at the top or even work your way all the way up to the top is because it's really hard to meaningfully engage with young people in a lot of the ways that I'm talking about. So um, some common issues that I have seen arise with youth engagement. Um, one that I've alluded to many times in, um, is around power sharing. So the idea of sharing power is often really hard and fraught in the community work that we all do. It's hard to partner with people in general um, to keep in mind multiple priorities and compromise um, to get work done effectively. Um, but there are some nuances and new um, challenges that come up with power sharing with young people. Um, one that I really encourage people to reflect on is adultism that most of us adults who are on this call have is some bias about what, it, what young people can bring to the table, what their expertise is. Um, that's really worth reflecting on um, what your biases are and maybe who in your organization is truly open to thinking about power sharing as well as like what's the structure of your organization and, and are you set up in a way that you can actually share power if the young people give input on an initiative or project that really conflicts with with what you've been thinking about doing or even that doesn't align with evidence-based practice what do you do with that like real issues come up um, with with how to really share power with young people um, youth, by definition, are often in a pretty transient stage of life. So um, young people transition into middle school and uh, out of middle school. Um, some people go to college, other people join the workforce. Um, it can just be really hard and turnover can be really high. And that's just something to know and plan for. I have not found a solution to that problem other than planning extra time, knowing that you'll have turnover and it will be a continuous process of finding new youth to partner with, training them up, and hopefully having some overlap to train kind of the next generation of youth partners. Young people face some additional logistical barriers like transportation, extremely limited time, and funding. So um, I have mentioned, but it's worth mentioning again, that young people the issue of funding becomes really, really important because young people often don't have um, expendable income. But, you know, they if they're going to share their time and expertise, often really need um, funding. This is especially important the more that you're trying to engage young people from a variety of socioeconomic backgrounds, which can be really, really important for diverse perspectives in your work. Um, it's really important to be able to fund young people. And this can be a huge barrier um, to prevention organizations where funding is often constrained. Um, young people are busy. They're often busier than most of the adults I know in the workforce. Um, they're balancing so many different priorities and often um, their commitments to partnering with organizations, prevention organizations or otherwise, it just has to be balanced against their very, very busy lives. And that can be a challenge. There are always challenges around finding the right youth, meaning like, First of all, reflecting on who are the right youth for our organization for this work at this time. Um, diversity is, it, it becomes a really important issue here. Um, it's hard enough to find and partner with young people, but they're really thinking about, are we offering this opportunity to a diverse array of young people, not just maybe top performers in school or the people who are already overcommitted, but are we really offering and then um, gaining the input of a diverse um, group of young people becomes really, really important. Um, once you have found good youth partners who are committed, sustaining commitment and motivation can be a challenge, um, a lot related to the logistical barriers that young people have and just them being really busy. Um, so it takes a 
often a really creative um, organization or staff person, a charismatic or um, innovative staff person that think outside the box about sustaining commitment and motivation, especially with youth partners. I've mentioned funding constraints, but those are really real. Um, I think you know a lot of us live in a world with grant funding that are um, that that are that constrain how you can spend money, and that becomes a challenge. And training. So this is one that came up in our interviews over and over. But a lot of organizational staff members I've talked with feel really committed to the idea of youth voice and feel a little bit at a loss for how to get the training in effectively partnering with youth and how to get their youth training in substance misuse prevention. Um, so I am going to flash up a bunch of resources that I know of, but I'll say I've been spending some time trying to find um, the organizations out there who do this kind of training. Um, and I do think it exists, but I also will say that I think it's a, a need um, for the prevention workforce. So in just a kind of graphic summary, I think combining the perspectives of the experts, the adult kind of staff members in your prevention organization combined together with the perspectives of young people um, who have um, their own lived experience and expertise to offer can combine to create something beautiful, um, but it really can, if done really well, create something new. Um, and that comes with both um, huge benefit and huge challenges for any organization. Um, in our youth engagement guide, we have quick do's and don'ts list. I won't go through them all, but I do want to um, just highlight a couple that, that maybe I haven't hit on um, as much in this presentation. Um, and one is that, let's see, fifth one down, consider really carefully consider how to communicate appropriately with parents and caregivers, depending on the age and stage and the nature of the youth engagement. So youth can be um, legal adults, um, but but you know minors under the age of 18 are still, um, there's still like legal constraints around how to interface with young people. One is like specifically that comes up is around providing transportation. Like can we safely provide transportation and what kind of um, consents and, um, things need to be in place to ensure safety with that kind of thing. So there really are some um, really important legal ethical considerations about working with young people and how to um, how to interface with parents, especially. I think I've touched a little bit on diversity um, and equity, but let me just um, underscore how important it is to seek youth with diverse backgrounds and perspectives. And this really does need to match what your prevention organization is doing or seeking to do. So it's kind of hard to give blanket advice around this, but often um, opportunities are not equally distributed to young people and young people who may have a lot of valuable perspective to share aren't always the ones who get opportunities um, to be involved with prevention organizations or um, other kinds of um, programs seeking their input. So it's really important both so that prevention can be responsive um, to a diverse um, range of young people, but also so that this opportunity that you're offering to young people is equitably distributed. It's a really an opportunity that we can make available um, diverse young people. Um, in terms of don'ts, I'll just hit on a couple. One don't that seems really worth noting is don't hold youth to higher standards compared to the standards of like that you hold other community partners to. And here's an example I have actually seen happen um, is we get so excited to have youth voice and we're like, we found the perfect you know, we found these young people who are committed to the substance misuse prevention and they have a personal connection to it and they're so powerful when they speak. So they come into a community meeting and we say, um, you know, hey, Joe, please, you have the floor. Tell us your experience of substance misuse in your family, right? Or something really personal that's actually like, pretty inappropriate and it comes from a good place of like we want to make sure young people feel invited to share their story and but often sometimes then we, we put them on the spot in a way that we really wouldn't do if um, if we had a like adult community member like it. So it's not really fair to to put young people in the spot like that to share personal experiences or to act as the mouthpiece for all youth. Um, another one I'll, I'll mention is don't put youth in roles they're not prepared for. So young people have their own expertise to offer, but they don't know everything. And especially important here is you and your prevention organization have a lot of uh, content knowledge and institutional knowledge to share. Um, and, and youth might not have that. So make sure to get youth the training that they need and not put them in a position where they're um, prematurely asked to speak on something that they're not actually prepared for. I'll just flash up the slide, but these are all hyperlinks to some different guidance on youth engagement that I have found to be helpful. 
And I wanna, I wanna leave time for discussion, so I'll just do one minute on this slide here. I'm really excited to be moving to a next phase of this research. And again, this is funded by NIDA, um, but using the um, everything we've learned from the qualitative interviews we've done and using the information guide we've developed, um, my team is, is now um, in, um, developing a youth engagement approach for organizations that's really um, based on us, our team, individually working with an organization to do planning, implementation, support, and then some reflection and problem solving um, around actually um, designing what youth engagement approach might look like for a particular organization. Um, so we're going to pilot this by working with one organization um, that'll involve like six to eight sessions working with our team. And then in return, we're going to ask staff and the youth they end up partnering with to provide input via surveys and brief interviews, and we'll provide a small stipend to the organization. Um, after we pilot that process, the youth engagement approach with one organization, we're going to implement a small um, randomized control trial, so doing the exact same process, but um, randomizing two organizations to work with our team for the youth engagement approach and two organizations um, randomized to prevention as usual, um, and then ask them all to actually answer surveys and interviews so we can really look at gathering some data around does the quality reach and uptake of our prevention actually get better when we implement a youth engagement approach that's tailored to our own organization? So that's kind of the next phases of this work. Um, we have a QR code. If you if you have a QR scanner and want to hold it up to that, that will take you to an interest form. Um, there's the link as well. Um, that'll just take you to a, a brief form. If you're interested in participating, I would love to um, collect some information about that at this point and within the next couple months hopefully we'll be actually ready to launch this next phase of research um, and and at that point we'll have a, a more of an application form if you're actually interested in partnering um, with our team in the next phase of the study. So returning to Pi, um, I hope that I have persuaded you a little bit if you weren't already persuaded that engaging youth voice is a promising and worthwhile approach to prevention, although not without challenges uh, and not to minimize those. Um, I hope I've informed you about some of the major considerations when thinking through youth engagement, um, what some of the different models might look like, what the challenges um, may be and, and where you can go for different resources. I'm not sure if I've entertained you, but I hope that if you're still here, that you, at least you're engaged enough um, and learned something. And I really appreciate you being here. And with that, I'll just say thank you. I have, I have included my email address. I'm happy to connect with people. And also, as um, Kristen said, we will share the slides. We'll share this video. We will share the youth engagement guide. So I'm very happy to share all of these resources and really hope that they're um, helpful to you all.